I'm going to boil it down even farther for you because when you do enough of these problems, you don't really need raw data to learn something from it. Here I'm just giving you the following. I'm giving you the correlation coefficient of two sets of data, 0.638. You would calculate this using Excel or your calculator using a table of data. Maybe you have 100 values or whatever. But in this case, I'm giving you that we actually only had 11 data points, 11 samples. And this is at, I'm going to test this at a level of significance of 0.05, same as last time, which is 95% level of confidence. And I want you to test, is there a significant linear relationship? Okay. Now, without looking at it, you can see the correlation coefficient is you know, not really close to zero. So you're inclined to think that there is some relationship there between the variables. However, it doesn't just depend on that. It depends on how many samples you have is going to determine if this number means anything or not, or not statistically. And it also depends on how sure do you want to be. I mean, you can relax the goalpost, make it 70% confident, and pass almost any test you want. But in this case, we're doing it 95%. So we're, at the end of the day, we're going to figure out if this is statistically significant or not. So the first step in this that I like to do often is just draw that picture. I know you're tired of seeing it, but I draw it. This is the T distribution, and I'm going to draw it because it actually helps me every single time visualize these, visualizing these things. So this is a T of zero in the center, and there's going to be a right-hand tail and a left-hand tail. All right, there's going to be a right-hand tail and a left-hand tail, because actually what I should do probably first before I do this, the null hypothesis, what is it? It's that the population correlation coefficient is equal to zero. The alternate hypothesis is that the co population correlation coefficient is not equal to zero. This one would imply that there's some sort of relationship between these two variables, some sort of linear relationship. So anyway, in the right-hand tail, you have an area of alpha over 2. But we already know alpha is 0.05 for our problem. You divide that by 2, you get 0 0.025. Just like last time, everything's the same so far on this stuff. Then you're going to have exactly the same thing here. You're going to have alpha over 2, which is 0 0.025. That's the area there. Now from that, you want to figure out what the value of t is coming out of that table that gives me that alpha over 2 area to the right. That's what I need to look up, and then I'm going to get a symmetric one on the other side, negative t alpha over 2 there as well. So the first step is actually to go and look at the table and try to figure out uh, what the value of t is here, and that's going to define my rejection regions. All right. Now, you should know by now that whenever you're using that chart, you're going to need to know the alpha that you're dealing with, which we have, but you're also going to want to know, in order to use the chart, the degree of freedom. For all these problems, it's n minus 2, and we have 11 samples here, so it's 11 minus 2, so it's 9. So the degree of freedom is actually only 9, and when we use that table, again, your table might look a little different. It might say one tail or two tails. The, the chart that I'm using is giving me one tail to the right. So really, I'm going to be looking for across the top 0.025 because it's giving me half of the area to the right at 9 degrees of freedom. So let's go down here and see what we get. So I go and find 0.025. That means this chart is going to return... Uh, is going to be tabulating the values of t that give me an area 0.025 to the right. This is a single tail chart. If you had a double tail chart, it would look slightly different. At 9 degrees of freedom, I go at 0.025 uh, and I get 2.262. So t alpha over 2 is 2.262. Just convince yourself of that. 0.025, 9, go over here, 2.262. So that's the cutoff value for my rejection region on the right hand side or in the right hand side. So when I go up here, t alpha over 2 is 2.262. So this is negative 2.262. You know, it's not like the f distribution where you're asymmetric. Here you actually have a symmetric distribution. So that the negative is, is, um, is the same as the positive value, it's just the negative version of it. So you have everything in place. You have your rejection regions defined. If I get any value over here, I'll reject. If I get any value over here, I'll reject, which means I'm going to say there is some kind of relationship there, significant linear relationship. If the test statistic falls anywhere in the middle, then I'm going to fail to reject, and I'll just say that, uh, no, there's nothing there, because it's just, or there's nothing there with, at this level of confidence. I can't be confident in my results, or that there's any relationship there. So the test statistic t is r divided by 1 minus r squared over n minus 2 take square root of this whole thing. Now, what is the correlation coefficient? It was actually given to us in the problem statement, positive 0.631. You would get that number from Excel or a calculator with your raw data, 
but here it's just given to us. 0 0.638 on the numerator. In the bottom you'll have z 1 minus 0 0.638. You'll square that, then you'll divide by n minus 2. n is 11. There's 11 samples here. Uh, and you already know that 11 minus 2 is going to be 9, so just go ahead and stick the 9 down here. That works. And then you just go ahead and put your, uh, your square root there. So basically you're going to square this 0.638, you'll take that number, 1 minus that number, then you'll take that result divided by 9, then you'll take the square root of that, then you'll have a fraction with these two numbers divided, and the value that you get from t whenever you uh, uh, do that is going to be 2.486. That's the value of t that you get. Then you go and you take a look, where does it fall? Here's 2.262, 2.486 is farther to the right, so I'll just go ahead and draw a line here, and it's somewhere over here. So it's definitely in the rejection region. So the conclusion is you reject the null hypothesis. And in words, what that basically means is that when you reject the null hypothesis, you say, we don't believe this to be true. The evidence supports the alternate hypothesis, which is that the population correlation coefficient is something other than zero. It doesn't tell you what it is because we don't know what the population correlation is. Population has a million people in it. All we did was sample 11 people here. We have no idea about what the population is, but we believe based on this small sample set that there has to be some correlation in the population, something. And we can gather more samples and more data to be more and more confident to figure out what this population correlation coefficient really is. So I'm going to reiterate some of the same things that I talked about last time. We did this at 95% level of confidence, 0.05 level of significance. If I change it, to 99.9 um, .9 or something level of confidence, that's going to make alpha really small. One minus level of confidence will be like 0.01 if you're doing 99%. So that means that this T alpha over 2, this value is going to be over here somewhere farther to the right. If I make this level of significance small enough, meaning my level of confidence is big enough, I can shift this goalpost far enough to the right where I will not reject that uh, guy anymore. Um, and so then in that case, I would say, well, I fail to reject. So by moving the level of significance around, you can actually get a different conclusion, even though you have the exact same raw data to begin with. Because you're making it harder and harder and harder to claim a dependence there when you're making it more and more and more confident in your answer, essentially. Um, and then secondly, we'll just kind of reiterate the same things here. Here we only had 11 samples. Okay, let's say for the sake of argument that we didn't have 11 samples. Let's say we had four samples. Okay, you're not going to be really confident with only four people that you survey, right? If you're trying to, to, to look at the population of, you know, adult males in the country and you only look at four people, that's not a great set of data. Even 11 isn't a great set of data either. But if you drop it down, what's going to happen? This number is going to go smaller, which means this number is going to go smaller which means when you make the denominator smaller, 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 what you end up doing is you're making, you're making the fraction bigger, bigger, bigger. Because you, you, you're dividing by a really small number, right, eventually. So you make this larger, even with the square root, you make the denominator larger, which means t goes down. So as I have smaller and smaller number of samples, if you take the limit and say you only have two samples, two minus two, zero down here, you take this number, you divide by zero, you're going to get effectively infinity here. You don't, I mean, the calculator tells you undefined, but you're going to get mathematically infinity. You take square root of that, you're still going to have infinity. R divided by infinity is what? Zero, right? So T is going to get smaller, smaller, smaller as the number of samples gets smaller, 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 even if you hold the same correlation coefficient. So whenever you decrease the number of samples, T goes down. That means instead of being over here, T goes down closer to zero. Even for the same correlation coefficient, if I have a really small number of samples, I'll be on the other side of the rejection region. I'll fail to reject in that case, right? Because the reason you're failing to reject is, yes, even though the data has the same correlation coefficient, if it's only three or four data points, you're not that confident in the answer. You can't really be 95% confident in that with only four data points is the point. So the hypothesis test takes into account the actual correlation coefficient the how sure you want to be and how many samples because more samples is better to roll it all into one conclusion so what we can say in this problem is at this many samples at 95 percent level of confidence i am confident that there is at 95 percent level of confidence a relationship between these variables because i reject this hypothesis and i say that the alternate must be true there must be a correlation at 95 percent level of confidence Make sure you understand this. I've talked a lot, but it's really important information. Now, notice again, we're not saying that one of these variables 
causes the other. We're just saying there's a relationship between them, a linear relationship. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of lessons. So follow me on building your skills and statistics one step at a time. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.